Hello and welcome to Toombu. My name is Dr. Lindsay Andrioli Comstock, and today we are talking worker rights and immigration with Armando Elenas from the United Farm Workers of America. Armando, thank you so much for being with us today. Hi, well, thank you so much for having me. It is really a pleasure. Armando, you and I have known each other for years, and I have always uh, respected deeply the work that you do with farm workers. Tell our listeners, what is the United Farm Workers? Well, uh, the United Farm Workers, uh, also UFW as the acronym, uh, the real, the actual full name is the United Farm Workers of America. Uh, and uh, it was founded in 1962 uh, by uh, Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, uh, uh, Andy Imutan, uh, and uh, probably uh, many other leaders that uh, may, many people have not heard of. It's a primarily uh, a labor union for farm workers in, uh, in the United States of America. It's, it is the largest uh, labor union for farm workers at this time. The, uh, the UFW advocates for uh, not only for farm workers' rights, uh, but also immigrant rights. Uh, the, U the UFW is uh, active more in uh, California, uh, Oregon, Washington, uh, the Pacific Northwest, the, the West Coast of the United States, uh, where also the heaviest concentration of farm workers happens yeah. to be. In Big the United fields States. out there. Right. So that's, that's, I mean, that's where the labor is. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, although we, I mean, we're, the UFW is also active on a national stage uh, in terms of different parts of the country, but the, the big focus is where, obviously, where the farm workers live. Sure. And they just happen to live in those uh, three states yeah. for the most part. Excellent. Excellent. Can you describe for us, and perhaps this is a difficult task, Armando, but uh, can you describe for us who is the farm worker in America today? What is their demographic? Who are they? Where are they from? Well, you know, farm worker typically now is it's actually the, for some people they call it higher labor. Uh, they're the actual worker that the farmer uh, uh, will contract either directly, um, more, more often the case through a farm labor contractor, which is a third mm. party that they use to, uh, to go and recruit farm workers. And so farm worker, uh, for the most part, is from Mexico. Uh, they, there's also others from uh, Nicaragua, El Salvador, uh, and other countries, but, but the, the biggest demographic by far is, uh, is from Mexico at this time. And a lot of times they also happen to be indigenous uh, mm. farm workers from the southern parts of Mexico, whether it be uh, Chiapas, Guerrero, Oaxaca, uh, right. or some of the big spending states. And so, and about 60% are, are male, mm. but there's, uh, you know, there's still a lot of more women. It just depends on the industry. It's yeah. kind of, goes, it goes by industry in terms of uh, where, where the, where some tend to be more women, some tend to be more men. Uh, and it also depends on the on the kind of work that they're doing, uh, whether they're in the you know late 30s, early 40s. Uh, it just really depends, and it varies by industry. Right, right. So I would imagine, Armando, that um, those who are harvesting Christmas trees, for example, uh, may be a different group of folks than those who are harvesting watermelons or strawberries. Um, different uh, strength needed, different skill set, perhaps. Yes, I mean, for example, strawberries is, is a good example. They'll tend to be more from uh, the, the southern states, Oaxaca, Guerrero, uh, because you're bent down in the rows. Mm. And so, so most likely it's easier uh, for some that are a little bit shorter. Uh, and then, uh, and, it's, and it's really mixed between men and women, uh, depending on what they are. So that's a, it's a very, uh, the ratios are very split between men and women, but in the tree, like for example, Christmas tree harvesting is more males, more oh. male dominated, uh, because it's heavier labor, right. but not, not only, there's still, you know, there's a misnomer that, uh, uh, that some women can't do that work, but, but, uh, not always, but it's just, uh, the statistically it's more male. Sure. Um, all the work is very seasonal. Mm -hmm. So the different seasons, different, uh, crops. And so, for example, in the winter months, for the most crops, it's when there's there's no production, so there's more pruning, which tends to be more male. But then when it gets into the harvest, uh, it becomes more uh, more female, mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, increases in terms of more workers uh, doing the harvest because everything's condensed into short periods of time. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's a really, that's an important distinction, the, uh, the different types of skilled labor and um, even body types that are needed to actually feed uh, the United States, to feed, feed the world in some respects, the work that yeah. these people are doing. No, that's correct. And, and then, you know, that also changes also with the pay structures because the growers pay differently, whether it be uh, some are paying hourly. Most agriculture now is by piece rate where they get paid by the bucket, they get wow. paid by the box, they get paid by the pound, or whatever the system that, that they're using. For example, on the, uh, you know, let's just say, right now, it's a t- right now in California, and in, in August time, it would be the, the harvest of the table grapes. Okay. So that's more an hourly plus system where they get a, a flat hourly rate, then they get uh, a, an incentive bonus of let's just say 35 cents a box, a 25 pound box of table grapes. And that okay. that 35 cents is split between the packer and the, the two pickers that are harvesting the, the grapes. Mm-hmm. And so the other thing, interesting thing that most don't understand, most uh, products um, don't actually go to some processing station and get all nice and cleaned up and washed. Tell Everything's pretty much that. harvested and harvested, put into a baggie, put into a clamshell, and put straight into a box. And that is your final product that the consumer ends up uh, getting at the most, at the end of the day, for the most part. The product that they're getting, the baggie, or the clamshell that they're getting, a farmer could actually pack that. Right. So it wasn't washed, it wasn't cleaned. Right. Uh, and so whatever, whatever dust or residue or pesticide residue or whatever right. is, is still on that product. So you, ha- you have to make sure that you clean it before you eat it. Yeah. But most, well, most, most people assume that, oh, no, no, this was washed before it was right. washed. To, to, the triple to wash the lettuce that we read about, right? All of that. Well, you know, that brings up a really important point. We're appalled when we hear of some sort of um, food poisoning or something like that, or some sort of residue that, that makes our hand itchy because some sort of pesticide has made it to the supermarket. But this is the hands that this has come from the hands that are touching the, these fruits and vegetables every day, all day long. So if we've got an itchy palm or we're having a little bit of an allergy reaction to something, imagine what farm workers in the field, because I think that old adage of the farmer kind of laboring in the field alone by himself <laughs> with a cow is just not reality today. This is a, no. it's the agro biz. This is a big business. So we've got hundreds no. of thousands of folks in the field who are touching this stuff every day. Yeah, yeah most of these, most of these, exactly. Most of these farms are, they'll, they'll, they, everybody has that quintessential family farm image. Yep. Right, and they, right. They, and they purposely say, oh, these are family farmers. But a lot of these are now, literally uh, corporate farms right you know for example again if you if if we look in the table grapes you could have a farm employing anywhere between ten thousand five thousand farm workers <sighs> obviously in that product but they'll describe themselves as a family farm right and so of its origins perhaps but not in right. reality today right, right. okay okay and so yes uh, you have all these farm workers that are literally you know touching your product that you're eventually going to put in your mouth. And most times I would say most people will take that product that was harvested by that farmer put directly into their mouth. And so if there's residue on that product, just imagine what that farm worker Absolutely. is having to go through. If you ever see pictures of farm workers, especially in California, you, you'll see a lot of times they're, they're covered up from head to toe. Yes. They're covered up with, with bandanas, covering up all you sometimes all you see is their eyes yeah you know you, they're covered up from, from here down and that's really you know and then and then of course on the, their head all the way to their neck and they're and they got these long sleeves everybody's thinking wait a minute it's, it's a hundred and it's 105 degrees yeah and yet you're covered up from head to toe aren't you burning up but it's really to protect themselves they're protecting themselves from the heat the sun yes. exposure from the dust the pesticides and all those different things that can that can get on them, uh, so it's really for for their own health that they're covered up. They're not trying to cover their faces for just to, because they don't want to show who they are. Right. They're covering their faces for the most part so they can protect their skin from the sun damage because you're out in the, you're out in the elements. Right, right. In a working way, so um, it's a you know, and it's it's a, so it's really interesting how all these different concepts come out when you, when they see a farm worker all covered up. 
Right, right. We, we, well, yeah, we let our mind tell us what that is. And in reality, it's, it could be something as practical as I don't have worker rights that provide protective material for me. Therefore, I'm protecting myself. Tell me, Armando, how important is an organization, a union like the UFW, to farm workers as they're advocating for their own safety as they do this work? One labor contractor told me once, he says, you know, you know, when the UFW is around, it's like there's a sheriff in town. <laughs> and so, but when the UFW is not around, when the UFW is not active in, in, a, in a particular area, there's no sheriff. So when, when we don't have a presence somewhere, that the abuse levels uh, go up dramatically because mm. there's nobody watching and nobody right. and, 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 the, and the growers know. Checks and know balances. Yeah. Exactly. So I always find that interesting where we have activity. We, it tends to, uh, to improve the conditions and also the benefits and the wages yeah. for all farmers. Excellent. Uh, and yeah. we, we see it time and, we see it time and uh, time and again. For example, in the, in the tomato industry, uh, you know, for the most part, it's in California where, the, you know, what we see tomatoes, if you go to a, a local uh, McDonald's, you go to a subway, you go to any of those fast food places where they're serving a tomato that's sliced. What, what people don't know is that those tomatoes are actually hand harvested and they're hand harvested green. So they look, they're totally green when they're harvested. And a farm worker will pick each one in a, one swift motion will use his thumb or her thumb to take off the stem. Wow. Because you know, if they leave the stem, the stems will puncture other tomatoes and then that'll cause the other tomatoes to go bad. Okay. So okay. they're harvested completely green. And then they're taken to a facility, sorted, packed, and then once they're sold, uh, if they're going to New York, for example, uh, they'll, they'll apply a, a, a certain percentage or a certain amount of chemical mm. to, to, so it'll, as, on, as they're going on en route to their destination, that, that gas that's applied will cause the tomato to go from green to red. Oh, and so, goodness. So if it's going to a shorter distance, let's just say if you're in California and you're going, in, you're going from Stockton, San Francisco, well, that's a much shorter distance. That's maybe an hour's drive. Sure. Well, they'll, they'll apply more gas because you need, you need more gas so the tomato will ripen faster. And wow. So, and that, that tomato uh, is what you eat in your McDonald's, is what you eat in your, uh, all these fast food places where, where they have the, the slices. Uh, but they're har they're harvested green. The workers are paid by the bucket. Uh, and for example, tell me, tell our listeners about what that's like. Because I know if I were paid by my production every day, I would make very little money. Uh, well, because some days are creative days and some days are production days. So tell me what it's like to be paid by the piece like this. Yeah, they're paid by the bucket. And the amazing part was, uh, I remember in this is in 2012, we got involved. The tomato bucket was being paid at 50 cents a bucket. And it's a 30 pound bucket, 30 pounds of tomatoes and the workers being paid 50 cents. And at the same time, they got to ensure that the bucket is, was flowing over, right. that the bucket is free of steam. And so, and they're going fast. So what, what we were able to do is we were able to uh, not only negotiate rates for the buckets to go from 50 cents. Now that bucket is, is at 70 cents, 76 cents a bucket. And now, that might not seem a lot from 50 to 76 cents, but for every penny that we were able to increase in, in the bucket rate, that translated to a 25 cents an hour wage increase for that worker. Unbelievable. Uh, How wonderful. So, and okay. We took, and we, and the, before, the, there was a, a, a form of punishment where a worker would take a bucket that wasn't full or the, took a bucket that had some stems in it. Well, the punishment was they would take the bucket, but they wouldn't pay them for that bucket. They would just at all, not for not any of it. it Unbelievable. No, it's your punishment. So we, we got rid of that system so that you get paid for all the work that you do. Um, and we ensured that workers got gloves so they can protect it. Imagine your fingernails and your oh. fingers as you, every moment you're, you're, you're taking away that, that stem. And so uh, we, we, we ensured the workers got gloves. And so that was with some of our con companies that we had, but then as a result of us being there, the rest of the tomato industry uh, ended up improving their conditions. And so on average in the last, uh, I want to say in the last uh, uh, seven years or so, 
we've been able to give the, the workers an increase of $10 an hour. Wow, that is so, huge, Armando. Huge. So a tomato worker that was making uh, $19 an hour on average, uh, uh, that's, you know, now they're making about $29 an hour on average. And that's, I mean, that's huge because there's some that will go so fast, they'll, they'll average about $40 to $45 an hour. Wow, uh, unbelievable. This is, I mean, they're going super fast. Uh, they might, and they might, only work for four, four to six hours, but they're just, you know, so they're, and, they're, and it's just, very you wanna, efficient. so it's, it is very skilled work. And obviously if you're not, if you don't know how to do that work, or if you don't you know, have the stamina, you don't have the dexterity, then of course you're, you're not going to earn that much. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Goodness. Agriculture was that if you, whatever before it was really like, you only get paid for what you pick. There was yeah. no guarantees of hourly wages. If so, so somebody says, Hey, I picked and I only made $20 worth. That's all you got paid. So, no, no incentivizing to actually learn the industry and become better. Uh, just fear from not being able to feed yourself, I would imagine, from the very beginning. Fear. Yeah. It's all fear based. It's all fear based uh, type of uh, discipline. And so, you know, so we, our presence in not only that, but then other areas, for example, in the Salinas Valley, where you have the, the lettuce capital of the world where you have the mushrooms, the strawberries, that's where I would say most of your strawberries, most of your lettuce in the United States is coming from that in the Salinas, from the Salinas Valley. Oh, from so one valley, okay. Most of the companies we've been able to negotiate healthcare. Uh, wow, for, for okay. Where, where the workers, actually we have one of the biggest companies called uh, the Arrigo Brothers, and they employ over 1800 farm workers and they get healthcare 100% paid for by the employer, for the entire family, mind you. How wonderful is that? Wow. In an industry that needs healthcare so badly, these people exactly. are physical well, labor in the sun, in California, yeah. So what happens is, uh, so it's the, the fact that we were, we've were we been able to negotiate healthcare for a lot of these companies has forced the, comp, the non-union competitors, the, the ones that don't have the representation, to also offer healthcare. Yeah. So that's, it's been, it's a huge transformation. It's almost a standard, it's a standard practice now in the Salinas Valley that they offer healthcare because they're trying to compete with the, with the farm workers that are represented by the UFW. And so, and then on top of that, obviously we do, we, we, we've done a huge amount of advocacy uh, to improve, not just the ones that are under UFW contract, but then all farm workers in general, yeah. whether we're in the last, I want to say 15 years, we've been fighting for heat standards. Yeah. California, it's very hot. You're talking about temperatures exceeding 100 degrees, uh, and so and you're working in the, in the elements with, you know, just in the direct sun. So we were able to lobby and get uh, standards that that forced uh, the growers to provide shade so the workers can recover from heat insulation. Mm -hmm. That they provide access to water, uh, training on how to deal with the heat, how to identify the heat exposure issues, right. and so. And now that's actually starting to become something where we're expanding it to, to a, a national level in, in, in terms of making it a national standard. So, and that, that heat standard not only benefited farm workers, but also has benefited anybody that worked outside, whether yeah. it be construction, um, you know, operating engineers and the roads and landscaping, et cetera. And so it really impacted over 800,000 people in, to have water, shade, wow. Mm, training Just whereas before really basic things yeah it sounds basic but, sounds we basic, had a fight but for it. yeah years of hard work no doubt went into seeing that these basic things were provided to folks that it's amazing to me how long um the struggle goes on in order to get these basic things so that people can do work well and in a and in a safe manner it's just unbelievable to me yeah. armando i think what i love most about what you shared is the intersectionality where when when one group champions a cause like healthcare for farm workers, it then raises the standard for everyone in the industry. Everyone that's working with farm workers, everyone that's working with folks in a field, um, everyone saying, okay, well, the standard has now gotten higher. Let's all rally together and now begin offering healthcare. So it's almost a healthy competition that betters all of us. It makes all of the, the human standards exactly. for everyone better. So I, I really I really love the way um, that can work for good, especially for the farm workers. 
you know, when Cesar and Dolores and the other leaders first started this, they realized that it was going to take more than a labor union mm. because the issues were much bigger. And so yeah. they formed other entities, uh, which we collectively call ourselves the Farm Worker Movement. And, and we, we have an organization that focuses on immigration services. We have an organization that focuses on building low-income housing. Wow. Uh, and another organization that focuses on, on communications for, to educate workers. So you mentioned, Armando, that there's a whole arm of the farm worker movement with, specific to the UFW that deals with immigration. Tell me, tell me how the immigration situation in America today is affecting farm workers. Well, it's, it's, it's just incredible. I mean, the amount of fear that has yeah. been generated. I mean, even, even today, yesterday, uh, at, the, at the moment, at the mention of, of anybody saying, hey, those immigration ICE uh, agents were over here, it just causes panic. And, and workers are saying, wait a minute, do I go to work? Can right. I take my kids to school? Uh, they don't know what to do. Of the 45 people that I remember that were uh, arrested uh, for deportation, only four actually had deportation orders. Uh, the other 41 just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Oh, goodness. Somebody just, you know, they were in the car that's, that was identified as belonging to somebody. And so, and these are people that are just, you know, they're trying to support their family. They're trying to do work. Right, you know, that we right. Do, right. And it trickles all the way down to the children, the right. farm workers, children of, because now the, the hate has spread as parents talk about it, their kids listen. And, and they go and, and tell their schoolmates and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, these Mexicans need to, need to be deported out of this country. And, and, they're, and they're listening to their, to their fellow students talk about, about that. So that, that is, it just it has so many ripple effects throughout the entire community. Right, right. Uh, Armando, tell us briefly, you know, there's the naysayer out there that says, People are taking our jobs. I know that Mar Armando, when you and I have marched together, we've heard that terminology. We've heard that counter protest and rally. To those people who perhaps don't understand the historical reasons for which folks from South and Central America come to America looking for farm work, what's a brief synopsis of why it is that folks are coming to do farm work in America? And, and then what would you say to someone that says, but they're taking our jobs? Well, one, if anybody says that they're taking our jobs, I'd say, come on down. Come There's on a down. job waiting for you if you can do There's it. There's plenty of work around. <laughs> the farm workers will tell you, you know, they'll train you, they'll help you learn your yeah. job. They, they say, come on down. And as a matter of fact, uh, several years back, we did exactly a campaign called Take Our Jobs, where we set up a website. We, had, we, we got over 3 million people expressing interest in coming work in the fields. And of those 3 million, 12 actually went. 12. And how many so, of those are still in the fields today, Armando? Well, that's, yeah, of all 12, <laughs> the, the first question is, how long do you expect to keep on working? And the, and the answer was, as soon as I get another job, I'm out of here. This is too hard. There you go. There so, you go. Uh, so I think uh, I would say, if that's your attitude, I would say, come on down. Mm. The, the, there's plenty of work to go around. Uh, it's honest work. In Mexico, which is one of the primary sending countries, the, for similar work, um, you could be earning about 200 pesos a day, which is about $10 a day. In California, you could be earning 10 times that. Sure. So, so for those people that say, you know, they're taking our jobs, they just really don't know what agriculture means. Right. And, and again, I would invite them to come on down. Yeah. Come on down. Yeah. It's only 104, uh, you know, minimum wage. Uh, no benefits. You and may take twenty dollars home with you today. Yeah, you, after your back. You could be earning twenty bucks for the day, but come on down and see if you can and see and 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 hopefully you'll make it because we yeah. need more. Yeah, I, Armando, you bring up a really good point. There's a disconnect between the historical reasons why folks have to leave native countries, home countries, to look for work. There's a disconnect between the reality of taking my job and the job people actually think they want. And there is no corporate ladder that exists in a field. And so in reality, if I want to better my situation, I most likely have to exercise my right to move. 
um, and to migrate and to go to a place where um, I can better better my situation. So yeah, thank you for that helpful explanation because you know sometimes we hear that terminology out there and we actually don't unpack it um, right. and realize it's not really grounded in anything. It's just a pithy statement no. that we share. And, and, we, and we also have to understand, I mean, the current demographics is Mexican, but the demographics change over the years. Yeah. I mean, I think we sometimes tend to, we, we, we tend to forget our own history because yeah. at some point, if I was Irish, for example, guess what? I was probably working in something, you know, whether it be construction or I was working in some type of, uh, in t or in the fields, you know, when the Irish folks, they were, they, they were doing the same thing. We're trying, they were trying to find, do something better for their family. Yeah. Yeah. Armando, I think I went to, I think I'm correct in saying that the last time I went to UFW headquarters, I remember seeing pictures of uh, Filipinos on the wall, historical photographs from the early days of the farm worker movement. The, that demographic of folks, immigrants moving in and out, um, doing this work has looked so different over the years. And so, but we've, but I think culturally, socially, we've, we've kind of demonized a people group when in reality that people group changes and will, it'll likely change again. It'll change again. Yes, as a matter of fact, in one of our, well, one of our martyrs was uh, Naji uh, Naji da, uh, da Fula. He was from Yemen. Mm. Uh, he was he was killed in one of one of the one of the grape strikes down in uh, in down in uh, Arvin, California, in the mm. table grapes. But uh, and also yes, our I mean when this organization was formed, there was actually two separate organizations. Going going back a little bit on the history, there was two separate organizations. Uh, one was the AWOC which is the Agriculture Workers Organizing Committee. And it was basically a farm labor union that was primarily Filipinos. Hmm. That was headed by Larry uh, Leong, uh, Andy Umutan, Philip Veracruz, and a couple other uh, other brothers and sisters that were in the, from the Filipinos. And then there was uh, NFWA, which is the National Farm Workers Association, which was um, uh, what's head, headed by Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. And when the Filipinos actually, they were doing strikes. They were they were striking and trying to increase the wages. When they came, when they got to uh, Arvin and the table grapes were going, uh, they went on a strike. And they and and they, but they realized they couldn't do it alone. Mm -hmm. They couldn't make it by themselves because the other rest of the workforce happened to be Mexicano, happened to be Chicano, mm -hmm. and so they went to Cesar and Dolores and said, "Hey, we need your help. We need to team up because it, it's not just us." Yeah. So, and eventually those two organizations merged and became the United Farm Workers of America. Beautiful story. I love that picture. I love that picture of working together, um, helping each other, realizing that we really are in this movement together, um, this struggle for justice and equality. Armando, shifting gear, gears just a little bit, tell me, where, when did the farm worker movement become part of your life? What is your story and your connection to this movement, apart from your very important role as the new secretary <laughs> treasurer? Congratulations. Thank you. Um, you know, well, I, just like a lot of kids, was um, trying to, my, my, my dad was a farm worker. I worked in the fields uh, in, in nurseries and different things myself. But then, you know, graduated high school and I was trying to figure out, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. I knew I wanted to do something. And so I didn't have any money. Um, and so I went and signed up and went to the Air Force uh, for four years. Um, and then came back, so got my money and GI Bill and stuff, and I'm going to go to college. So while I was in college, I started getting active uh, with, uh, with a group called Mecha, uh, a little uh, Chicano group in, on, in there in, on, in the school grounds. And they, and they invited me to, to a conference that the farm workers were having. And I had no idea who they were. I really didn't know. I didn't know who Cesar Chavez Despite was. Despite being that. one yourself, you didn't know about the movement. <laughs> no, yeah, didn't, know the, didn't know who it was. Didn't know any. Didn't know Dolores Huerta. Didn't, didn't know anything wow. about that. Wow. And so, um, I just got invited and, and I said, you know, and I and I, I went to that conference and got the whole few, the whole, you know, whole uh, full, full recruitment pitch where it was like <laughs> Dolores Huerta was there, Richard Chavez, Cesar's brother, uh, was there, uh, you know, Paul Chavez, Cesar, Cesar is, Cesar's son was there, yeah. uh, Arturo Rodriguez, the, the, the former president of the United Farmers was there, and, and many others. And so, and so 
I just got intrigued by what they were doing and I, and I started volunteering. And then I just got invited to an internship and said for like a six week internship, <laughs> come for six weeks. They said, come, they said, come <laughs> Try for it six out weeks. and see what you think. Yeah, come for six <laughs> weeks. You know, and the funny thing is that about a week into it, I kind of said, this is kind of cool. There's an impact, it's fun. That was over, over, over 20 years ago. Wow. And, uh, you know, and, and we're still very much the same. We, we, you know, we're very, we're very grassroots. We're very, uh, you know, in, in with, in terms of keeping everything on the ground with farm workers and, um, and just, and it's always changing. You're always doing something different. Uh, so, and then just the, the need is incredibly still there. And unfortunately mm -hmm. it's probably going to be there for a while. It's just, so, there's so many systemic issues, but, um, but that's how I got involved. I, I got involved because of just, I guess through luck, yeah. uh, different parts. But I still remember uh, when I got invited and I was down in Ox in LA and I was asked to go to Oxnard. Oxnard is just north of LA, about an hour north of LA. And there was strawberry farmers there and farm workers that were being organized. And so I went and I had no idea. I was totally green, didn't know. I thought they were going to be so happy to see me. <laughs> Little uh -oh. did I know. <laughs> but I remember so clearly because I went and knocked on his door uh, for this farm worker and he wouldn't open the door. He was so petrified, scared that something would have happened to him. And, um, but I talked to him through the door and then I said, and he's, you know, and then I said, I'll come back a little bit later. Came back a couple hours later and he got him to open the door a little crack. And, and then, you know, talked a little bit more. I said, I'll come back the following day. We'll talk some more. Came back the following day, and he was actually he let, he led me to his house, and we sat down, talked, and he was so scared. But then, uh, and I left. I went back to LA, and I came back, and I remember I walked into this meeting, and to my surprise, that same farm worker was in front of a group of farm workers, you know, just preaching to them and telling them that they should organize, that they should change, they should get empowered and change things. Wow. And I was just blown away. I'm sitting there like that's the same guy that I remember visiting and wouldn't even open the door. So, you know, in that moment, that change, that that change that I saw in that worker, you can't take it away. Yeah. You know, you can't take it away. And and, that, and, that, and that's what I think that's what really got me. I said, wow, you know, I played a small part in that. Yes. Uh, I'm sure others did more, but but uh, but it was that was. That was really, that really motivated me. And I, and I still get that. And I still see when you help somebody and they're like, they're like, and they, and they're like, they've learned something. They're, they're, they feel empowered. They feel they can take something on and they don't lose that anymore. Yeah. And that's, that's enough. That's right there. That's, that is just, that right there is enough for me. And, yeah. I, and, I, and that is, you know, I, I love seeing that. So that's oh. why it, it keeps yeah, you going. It's, it's sharing hope with people. You know, you, you, you were so persistent in, in, in talking to this individual and, and it, it, feel, it almost sounds like in your story that hope was instilled in him and now he's sharing that with others and we kind of pay it forward in that way. Well, I, yeah. I think that's a beautiful picture. I mean, those are, those are the opportunities that you, you have. I remember so vividly uh, during the heat campaign back in um, 2009, um, uh, we were in Southern California and I get a phone call from a worker who says, my, my niece just collapsed mm. and sitting in a hospital and something happened and she didn't have water. She didn't get training. She didn't have shade available. Mm. Uh, and I don't, I don't think it was right. And I want something done. And, and I just want something done because it shouldn't happen to somebody else. And I remember when I was, and I was like, uh, and I said, okay, and it was three, four hours. I think it was about three, four hours away. And I remember I said, okay, I'm, we're, we're going up. And, and I talked to my organizer. I said, hey, a, there was a farm worker that collapsed. She's in a coma. She's 17 years old. Goodness. And no, no access to water, no shade. And she, um, you know, when she collapsed, the, the supervisor basically told her, oh, told, told the, 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 the boyfriend, I just put her in a van and she'll be okay. In a van that had been sitting in the hot sun the entire day. 
Unbelievable. Um, and they took it to the van, didn't even turn on the air conditioning. They just sat out there and they're like, oh, it happens all the time. She'll, she'll wake up. And uh, then finally they said, wait 20 minutes because the crew's almost done. You can take her and then you can take her. They had Cause they were all riding in that van. Right. And they said, go to the store, buy some rubbing alcohol and put it on her back or her neck and she'll be fine. It happens all the time. And, and so they waited till three o'clock. Everybody got out and they went to the store and it didn't work. So she, they, and they said, look, we, we got, we, we just got to take her to the hospital. Right. And they were, so petri- they were so petrified that the van took them there and it literally just left them there because they, they, they everyone was scared that something was going to happen to them. Sure. But, you know, so when, when that, when I got that call, we said, you know, just go North. I remember my, our, uh, we we started driving. No, we didn't even know where we were going. Oh, we we, didn't, we had no address. We had no location. We just knew it was north. Right. I said, said, go north. By the time we, you, we by the time you drive for an hour or two, I'll have an address for you, and, and we'll figure it out. And that's exactly what we did. We both started wow. driving. It was another organizer and myself. We both driving driving north. And sure enough, about two hours into the road, we figured we had we got an address of a location. But you know, and that's and that was uh, and as a result of her death um, and her and her uncle's bravery, uh, we changed the law. Wow. And so uh, the young woman was Maria Isabel Vasquez Jimenez. She was 17 years old, had been working in the fields for three days, had come from Oaxaca because her single mom uh, didn't have enough money to buy uh, food for her brothers and sisters and she had decided to come up and, uh, and help. And unfortunately, three days into her first job, uh, uh, collapsed and collapsed and died and she, uh, it was later found that she had a core temperature of 106 unbelievable oh and, goodness and also that and that she was and actually that she, that she actually happened to be also pregnant so it just you know and so and i remember that so clearly because and, and her uncle Doroteo, who basically you know allowed us to share that moment yeah. but also use that moment to improve the lives, improve the conditions for thousands of farm workers. Yeah. Uh, and recently they named the law after her uh, wow. because of the impact that her death had. It shouldn't be that way, unfortunately, but I, that's, uh, that's uh, it's just what it does. And so the opportunity that we have to create impact, the yeah. opportunity to, to actually have real change, it might be, it might seem small for some, but, but, uh, we find it pretty amazing and, and, and to be to have the privilege to do that i think that's kind of cool and yeah. so, so that's why you know that's why i'm still here and that's why i love uh doing what we do marmanda you have committed so much of your life uh to this cause and you're right one death is way too many um but knowing that people like you good-hearted people like you are out in the fields um doing the important work of advocating, trying to prevent these tragedies from happening is, um, is so comforting to me. So tell our listeners, how can the everyday person who maybe has forgotten about the farmer for movement and doesn't realize it is still strong, or somebody who has just learned about it from this talk with you, how do we get involved? How do we find you so that we can support this work? Well, three different ways. One, um, you can visit our website, uh, ufw.org, okay. and join our listserv and you know be part of those action alerts and just click and take action go to our facebook uh account based uh, you know just look for ufw and um and get active with us uh third um you know obviously we we could always use the help financially you sure. know make a donation uh, uh we're we we're totally dependent on what the farm workers provide in terms of uh, fees and dues and then obviously what what supporters provide in terms of donations and you know we'd love to do more but uh, obviously it takes resources to be able to do so so if if you go to our website join our listserv if you you know follow us on facebook and third if you're able to make a donation those three things would be a, a major impact for us absolutely absolutely and at the end of this video you'll have links so that you can um, you can follow up on those three suggestions that Armando has given us. You know, as, as, as a school, as an organization, we, we really em- try to embody global citizenship in so many ways. And I think you're the perfect example 
of a person who has their own story, but then becomes part of the story of so many other people and allows walls and boundaries to disappear so that you can, so that you can focus on humankind and doing what is right and good in the face of injustice. So Armando, thank you for the work that you do, for your long history in doing that work. Uh, please pass on our, our, uh, our love to the people of the UFW and know that there are organizations and people out here that support the work that you do and are just trying to spread the word um, to, to help you continue that work that you do. So thank you so much, Armando. Thank you. Thank you for the time and the opportunity to be with you and share. Uh, because obviously these issues are, are they're global. Absolutely. You know, they're, they're, happen they're happening in every, every country. There's, there's uh, change that needs to happen for all farm workers. So, so thank you for your time. Absolutely. Thank you.